Good afternoon everybody or good morning. Welcome to today's webinar which is a follow-up from our previous webinar uh, specifically talking about Capture One for uh, Fujifilm. So we gave you a few tips on, oh hang on my light's not on, one second. I thought why am I sitting in the dark? Um, where we gave you a few tips about uh, getting started with Capture One uh, and this one is more designed to kind of dig a little bit deeper, get into a few more advanced techniques so we're going to dip into some certain aspects of uh, Capture One to inspire you uh, to, to look a bit further. Um, now, if you haven't seen the first one, doesn't mean that all of this is uh, null and void. Uh, you can still use it and, and take it away as techniques. Uh, the original one's on our learning hub, learn.captureone.com. Okay, so you can always pick it up there, but please don't leave if, uh, if you feel you can't pick this one up. It will be, you will be perfectly fine, don't you worry. Okay, so uh, today we're going out in our webinar room, so hello to the, the people in the webinar room, and we're also going out to uh, Facebook and YouTube as well. Uh, so before we get into looking at Capture One, just a couple of housekeeping comments. <clears throat> uh, so as usual, we have the max of 60 minutes, so I will definitely keep it within uh, that time period today. I always say that and often overrun, but definitely today uh, we shall keep it within those points. Um, we are recording this too, so don't worry if you um, miss any part of it or whatever, then you'll be able to pick it up directly on the Learning Hub uh, tomorrow as well in that same place. Um, if you would like to ask questions, of course, you're very welcome to put your questions and comments either in Facebook or YouTube. I can see them both coming in. If you're in the webinar room, uh, you can ask a question in the Q&A tab. And if you have a specific question, uh, it's good to put it in the Q&A tab. That just separates it out uh, from the chat. And I can see everything else that's coming in from uh, Facebook and YouTube as well. Now, if you want a bit more screen real estate, uh, in the webinar room and you can just click on that arrow and then it will hide it and you'll have a bit more space. Okay, so let us begin. So let's bring up Capture One and myself on screen <coughs> like so and let's get started. So we've got a few things that we were going to uh, discuss today. So we were going to look at um, color editing in particular because we didn't go into that much on the first webinar. Um, also a little bit about color grading, which is slightly different to color editing. We have a little introduction to working with layers because that kind of makes everything more awesome in Capture One as well. And we have a very, very brief, and it is going to be extremely brief, little look uh, at how to tether your camera. So that's just going to be the first steps. What we're going to do uh, in July is actually do another session like this all about tethering, uh, where we can go into uh, a lot more detail about the setup, about naming conventions, file management, all kinds of uh, other bits and pieces. But for, for now, uh, we we'll keep it very simple. So I saw a couple of comments on YouTube about tethering uh, with the GFX um, 100. There is a special thing you need to know about the GFX 100, which I discovered uh, myself. Um, so uh, uh, hold that thought and we'll be back with that at the end of the webinar as well. But it works great. There's just a couple of little oddities uh, with the GFX 100. Okay, so uh, we've got um, a shot up here on screen. Let's just make sure I'm not obscuring anything. And the first thing I said we're going to talk about is color editing, because that's a really huge part of Capture One. Uh, lots of flexibility and options on how to edit your colors. Uh, and we can either choose the basic route or the advanced route. And then we can also look at uh, skin tone as well, because we have a specific tool just for working with skin tones. So first of all, looking at this shot, I'm just gonna crop it so we can go in a bit closer. I'm gonna right click and choose my square crop. It's with my crop tool selected. So as soon as I adjust, it's gonna edit down to a square format. Let's crop in a bit tighter as well. So let's zoom in on uh, Roosevelt Island, because obviously we've got a nice dominant red color here that uh, is a good example for us to edit. And then we can compare that to this shot on the GFX 100, which also has some red in it, but we can see the difference quite clearly between how the basic color editor works uh, and how the uh, advanced color editor works. So where are those tools? If we go to our color tool tab, you'll find the color editor down here and it's divided up into three tabs, basic, advanced, 
and skin tone. Now the basic, I'm sure you can all pretty much figure out how that works, but there's a couple of little handy things and nuances that are good to know between basic and advanced. So the obvious intuitive way to use this tool is uh, to first pick a swatch. So if I go for the reds, for example, notice how these bars change. So it shows you the action of what's going to happen on those sliders. So if I went to a different color tone, you can see those bars change. So you know what happens when I push either of those sliders uh, left and right. Now, going back to the red again, let's just zoom in to 100% so we can see our nice red cable car. Obviously, this is really simple. Either of these sliders, if I grab lightness, that's gonna make my red tones darker. Easy, I'm sure you can all understand that. Same for saturation, we could reduce or improve saturation. And then you can see by moving the hue slider, exactly the net result that's gonna have on those red tones. So more magenta -y, going to more kind of orangey, I guess, like so. So let's reset those. So fairly obvious how to pick a swatch and make some edits. Uh, I don't know if we've got, we've got a little bit of a blue sky. Uh, if you're not sure which color patch to pick, then you can do one of two things. You can grab the color picker and click on the color tone you want to edit and Capture One will give you that suggestion. So you should be working off this color tone. And then again, let's uh, zoom out by selecting my hand tool. And if I change lightness, then you're gonna see our sky darken and then we could add some saturation like so. Simple. Now, maybe a somewhat, oh. <laughs> no, I wouldn't Alexa. I'm just gonna turn Alexa off because she been very rude and interrupted me the past couple of sessions. So Alexa is now officially unplugged. Right, um, as I was saying, if you want a faster way to work, then what we can do is use this color picker in a direct uh, color editor kind of way. So again, if we let zoom in and go back to our cable car like so, grab our color picker and now instead of clicking once, if I tap once, it shows me, okay, this is the color tone that you should edit. If I click and hold, Okay, and I'll do that again. I'm, go I'm in between the T and the I on Roosevelt Island. Uh, so if I click and hold, you'll briefly see a little four-way cursor pop up like so. So what it means now, <clears throat> and I'm holding my mouse down or pen, if you're using a Wacom, what it means now is that if I drag to the left, then if you look at the lightness slider, then it's also moving to the left. If I drag to the right, then it's moving the lightness slider to the right like so. If I go up and down with my cursor, then I'm changing saturation like so. So if I wanted to add a bit more saturation and darken this down, I could do so. Uh, now, what about, um, we've got three axes here. So how would I activate the hue slider? So if we right click with our um, color editor picker chosen, then we have the direct color editor settings. So I think I've changed this from default slightly. You might find the default is slightly different, but I personally uh, didn't like um, um, uh, the way the defaults were set up. So for me, I like saturation on vertical, lightness on horizontal, and hue is an alt click and a horizontal drag. So if I wanna pull the hue around, if I hold my alt key down and click left and right, see now I can change the hue like so. So personal preference really, however you prefer to manipulate the direct color editor, but it's just a really easy way to kind of whiz around the image. I'm gonna click on the blue. I want to, let's see, darken this down a bit or lighten it up. So I can just drag with my cursor, desaturate, add some saturation and so on. So it's kind of a speedy way just to move around uh, uh, the photo. So for quick, simple, um, color editor changes. The basic color editor is definitely your friend. Also the benefit of using the direct color editor, so click and hold, you'll see if I start dragging left, notice that it's picked up two color patches, like so. So you can see it's chosen two color patches. So if we now examine these, you can see it's made a combination change between these two. So there's an additional sort of level of uh, accuracy, for example. So basic color editor, as I said, great for those small, quick changes. Um, now to change the default of how the color editor works, because I think um, that's what you are asking in the background, you see the two little lines down here, or we can right click 
with that chosen. So if I do a right click, then the direct editor color settings come up. Now the sensitivity, that's how sort of pronounced your mouse moves are. Uh, so if the sensitivity is very high, just a little drag with your mouse or pen has a big impact on the slider and vice versa. Um, so again, that's something which you can tweak to your own personal preference. I think the default's um, about right. Okay, um, now if we click this box, you can see here we can change the color ranges. Now, if you're starting to get interested in this, so this is telling me the red swatch here affects this tonal range of uh, the photo. And you can see if we turn view selected color range on and off, we can see exactly what tones it's gonna to edit. Now, if you're thinking, oh, this is interesting, I'm gonna start playing around with those, I would say, don't. You sound like an ideal candidate for the advanced color editor. And the main difference is between basic and advanced is that you have much more control over the range of colors uh, that you're gonna have affected. So if we turn off view selected color range and we go to our advanced tab, let's scroll down a bit so you can see the whole tool. Uh, I'm gonna reset the basic advanced, sorry, basic advanced. I'm gonna reset my basic color edits just so we can have a different comparison. So when we dig into the advanced color editor, we can see nothing is lit up. So it's kind of a blank canvas for you guys uh, to work with. So it might seem a little bit intimidating at first, but don't be. Um, it's actually very simple to use and just gives you that extra level of control. So then you might ask, well, why have the basic color editor? Works great just for quick, speedy color edits. But if you do find you're in a situation where you need to be a bit more critical, then the advanced color editor is your friend. So once again, if we see our color picker here, we then have to go in and choose the color that you want to edit. So if we click here, like so, Capture One immediately gives me a suggested color range. So the dot, that's the color tone I picked. So in between the T and an I of Roosevelt Island, that's the exact color tone of that. Now the hard edge around it, uh, that is the range of colors that I'm gonna edit. Now the big difference between basic and advanced Whenever we're editing a color in the basic color editor, we are affecting the entire saturation range. Whereas the advanced color editor, we can choose to affect a broad range of colors, a broad range of saturation, or a narrow range of saturation, and a narrow range of colors, and so on. So, if we turn on, we need to scroll down a bit, view selected color range, let's collapse layers so you can see the whole tool. Right now we can see exactly which color tones this is going to affect, like so. So we can see quite clearly, obviously, we're going to affect the red on the cable car. Um, but we're also just, if we zoom into 200%, so you guys can see, we're also picking up a little bit of their skin tones and so on. So if I squeeze this down, like so, then we can actually isolate it so it's just the red on the cable car. So anything in monochrome is not part of my color selection. Now we can also choose to have a narrow range so we could go very tight to my picked color or if we zoom out from this shot, uh, if there's any sort of foliage or greenery, if we went in this direction or maybe more this direction and out this way, we'd start to pick up, see our trees down here as well. So they are now part of this selection. So if you need a broad range of color edits, you can do so, or if you want to be super critical, then we can just isolate exactly what we wanna have like so. So really that is the main difference from the basic tab, is that you have the ability to have much more control over what color tones you're gonna isolate. Now, you'll see we've got the three same sliders as before, so hue, saturation, and lightness. There's also this additional one at the top called smoothness. Now what smoothness does is control the roll off into the neighboring colors. So the hard edge on my color editor, that's the range of colors we're gonna edit. The fuzzy edge, that's how it kind of rolls off into the neighboring colors. So the default of 20 is generally pretty good you'll see if I put smoothness down to zero, notice how now we've got no fuzziness around the outside. Now, if I zoom into like 
the edge of the cable car and then if we put smoothness back up then it depends sometimes if we have smoothness very low and I make this super critical something like that what we start to see is see now we're losing our color selection where the color tone is slightly different if I bring smoothness back up we're now pulling more of that in so it really controls how if you get a nice roll off into neighboring colors as I said generally the smoothness value is pretty good um, but if you do need to be really critical then that's something that you can do actually if we look at our if we digress and look at our super nerdy uh, color chart uh, if I can find it color tables you'll be able to see what's happening. So let's zoom in a touch on, let's just go over to this end of the spectrum. Let's reset what we've done on here before. So let's click over here, turn on view selected color range. That shows me the range of colors we've got uh, selected. Obviously I can have a broader range, I can have a narrower range. If I cut this out, then I can reduce the lower saturated colors. Or if I go in this direction, I'm gonna cut out the higher saturated colors and if I turn smoothness down it becomes a very hard edge selection like so so that's really all there is to it so I would say don't be intimidated by uh, this tool um, it's super simple to use let's find where's our photos there we go now the other benefit of the advanced color editor is that we can have we're not limited to just one color pick let's just reset what i did so if i click on the reds i'll zoom in a bit for you and then we made our edits so i want to make that a bit darker i don't know affect the people inside so i'm going to cut that out and then we're just going to push the hue in that direction a bit and then let's say i wanted to do the sky so we could go up and click on the blue that gives me another entry in the color editor if we zoom out and turn on view selected color range, you can see exactly what that's going to affect. Now, if I wanted to be sure I was covering all the blue blues in that uh, color pick and the entire saturation range, then I could extend this out and then I could also cut out. You can see the difference here as well. Uh, turn this off and then now I can play around with what I want to do with my sky like so. So it's a hugely practical, versatile tool up to 30 different color picks. Now this little action of expanding out the saturation range, there's a shortcut for that. So if we look down here on this icon, then if we click that, that automatically says cover the entire saturation range of my chosen color, like so. Okay, let's have a look at um, a couple of questions. Uh, for those of you uh, lamenting your GFX 100, don't worry. We will get to that. It's okay. <laughs> um, just having a look in the webinar room. Let's see. Uh, good question from Carl, actually. When you're color editing in Capture One, is it Adobe RGB or sRGB? It's in a constant state of proof, I guess. So if you look under, um, where is it? Image. I can't remember where it is. Let's check. Because um, it's something I very rarely look at because it just... Uh, works. So I'm going to make myself look like a, an idiot, idiot here. Um, let's see if I type this in. Whoops, wrong shortcut key. P uh, proof, uh, proof profile. There we go. In view. Thank you. Help menu. Okay, proof profile. So by default, it's the currently selected recipe. So what does that mean? So whatever recipe I have selected, Capture One will be proofing to that profile. So if I went to TIFF, like here, for example, I'm now working in Adobe RGB. If I went to this JPEG um, process recipe, I'd be working in sRGB. So that's an important thing to know. Um, it's the selected recipe, or you can override it. So that's what you need to do, Carl. But I wouldn't get overly concerned with it too much. Um, let's have a look. Can you publish your HSL table or a similar file? I don't have Photoshop to generate one. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I will tag it to the YouTube video. So just put that in the description of the YouTube video. Um, okay, let's just go over to Facebook and YouTube uh, and see what's over there. Let's take a look. Okay, um, I see uh, you're helping each other out on YouTube. That's very nice. 
Thank you for helping each other. That's great community spirit. What about the sky color only, only without affecting the water? Well, we're gonna to get to that, but sometimes uh, if we pick our color tone again, the water is kind of less saturated. So if I cut those out, then we can just do that, for example. So you can see there, if I pull that up, then we're affecting less of the water like so. But we could also achieve that with a layer, which we're gonna to get to. So that's a good learning moment, David, who asked that. We're gonna come back to this shot and we can see exactly how to just do the blue sky and isolate something else. Let's look at our a quick final example here of this guy. So if we wanted to edit the reds, and this is on a GFX 100, then I would choose my red patch or use the direct color editor. And then of course we could tweak those values. But as you see, as I'm adjusting, it's also affecting whatever this out of focus thingy is in the background. And there's no real way I can limit that because it's red, but it's in a lower saturation range. So the simple way around that is in our advanced color editor, pick our berries once more, turn on view selected color range. And if I go in this direction, I can pretty much cancel those out without actually affecting my picked color. And if I'm worried, I'm picking up a bit of the crust, I could probably move closer in this direction and this direction and have a very isolated color pick. So now if I tweak my lightness, you can see we really targeted it to just those points. So again, simple demo, but just does show the difference between basic and advanced. Basic, great for quick, simple edits. Advanced, if you need to, and you don't always need to, but need to isolate a bit more, then the advanced color editor is your best buddy. Okay, um, the last tab we have in the color editor is for uh, skin tone. Um, so let's find our skin tone. And really the point of, we're gonna come back to this, this handsome chap when we edit a bit more about layers. So let's have a look at this guy here, just hide my browser with Command B, and let's look at this chap. Now, there might already be an edit on this photo, there is, so I'm gonna reset it so it's back to zero. Now, really, the whole sort of point of the additional tab skin tone is for this additional bank of sliders called uh, uniformity. Uh, nobody has perfectly uniform skin tone, of course, and nobody has perfectly uniform skin tone over their entire body either. Um, so quite often when you're working with um, people, men, women, adults, children, doesn't matter, uh, you'll see variations in skin tone and often caused by lighting as well. Like in this situation, we've got this guy, he's got a bit of window light coming in and he's got some artificial light on this side. So we're gonna see a difference in color tone and also on his nose, we can see quite a difference in color tone. As soon as, as the light kind of moves over here, then we're actually seeing a change. It's, it's kind of much colder and so on. Now to fix that in Photoshop is kind of tricky. I actually wouldn't know where to start. Um, in Capture One, it's actually very, very simple. So uh, the additional of the skin tone tab kind of works in a similar way, but really what we're doing is we're telling Capture One, uh, this is my target skin tone, and I want everything to match that target skin tone. So on this guy's face, uh, do we need to do any edits first? Let's just do a quick, um, I'm just gonna bring up the brightness a bit in the mid-tones. Let's open up his shadows slightly and the blacks darken a little bit. And let's just bring our highlights down slightly, okay. So now looking at his face, we've got that slight variation in color tone there. And also when we look at people's hands, especially if they're cold, they have a much more magenta tone, which again, if the hand is close to the face, often it can be uh, really sort of uh, glaringly obvious. Okay, so workflow for the skin tone tool, very simple once again. Uh, we grab our picker and then we say to capture one, uh, what is my target skin tone? So I'm gonna say over here, this is the skin tone I like. So I'm gonna click there. Now capture one gives me a suggested color range once more, once more. So I'm gonna just make sure I'm gonna encapsulate every imaginable skin tone on his face. 
And again, I can use view selected color range to see what that's picking up. So notice that his face didn't go to monochrome. So that's a good selection of his face. Now we've got the same tools here, hue, saturation and lightness. So if I wanted to darken my selection or lighten it, I could do so. But these have quite a fine level of adjustment. Um, so you'll find even moving the sliders to their maximum, it's very subtle because it's designed for skin. Now the cool bit is for uniformity, as soon as I start to drag this slider to its maximum, what happens is everything in this picked range, so everything in that triangle will get transformed to the picked color. So watch what happens if we go hue all the way to the right, notice that now the skin tone is kind of equalized across his entire face. Now you're gonna say, that's great, but what about his lips? Because if I go back to zero, you don't want his lips matching his skin. That would look a bit stupid. Um, now, if you're lucky, you might be able to skinny this down a bit and just sort of try and cut that out of uh, the color range. But generally that becomes a bit of a fiddly lengthy exercise. So the best thing to do is to work on a layer, which kind of introduces us to the second part um, of, uh, uh, of um, our webinar, uh, which is to talk about the versatility of layers. So what layers allow you to do is to target your adjustments uh, to a particular spot. So going back to David's question earlier about blue sky water, in this case, we want to do skin, not lips. So what we want to do is just target a particular area for our adjustments. So we're going to reset what we've done here and expand out our layers tool. And what the layers tool allows us to do um, is to create a mask. And we can create a mask in lots of different ways, like using a brush, using a gradient, um, using an auto brush, using the color editor to create a mask, a whole bunch of different ways. But essentially, creating a mask of saying, I want the edits to only happen here, or in David's example, just on the sky, not the water. So what we're going to do for him, we're, I'll show you a simple method. We're going to grab a brush in our layers tool. We're going to go over onto the photo and right click. And we're going to make the brush a bit smaller and a little bit harder. And we're going to put flow up to 100. More on that in a second. And we're going to mask basically where we want the edits to happen. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of do a you know rough mask over the problem areas if you like. So that's kind of this spot and it doesn't have to be especially accurate. Let's just go down here as well because there's a little bit of color variation. You might spend a bit more time doing this but you don't want to watch me mask a guy <laughs> for three minutes. Okay so we've just done a quick clown mask like so, uh, just on the skin tone that we want to edit. Okay, so that's using the brush icon like so. If I made a mistake anywhere, whoops, I've gone over, then I grab my eraser, right click, just make that a bit bigger, and then I could take my errors away like so. So now we've just got a um, mask on that spot. So now what I'm free to do on adjustment layer number one is go back, grab my skin tone tool, let's press M to hide my mask, and kind of repeat the operation once more. So I want to choose the target skin tone, which is around here. Now I'm working with a mask, I'm gonna be bold and just think, well, let's just make sure I've got every color range within my mask. And then now when I drag up my hue slider for uniformity, you see it's making the skin tone uniform, but it's only in the mask area. Now you could say, hang on a minute, that's not um, uh, super accurate because that's too perfect. We can always dial this back to some extent. So we could pick a happy medium of somewhere around there. Saturation will just level out the saturation. Lightness will just flatten all the hard work you've done uh, with your lighting. So again, that's kind of use with care. But it's you know super simple to just achieve that balance. So if we turn this adjustment layer off, and then back on, then you can see the changes that it's making like so. So very simple just to make an easy skin tone uh, correction like so. 
Um, okay, a couple of questions before uh, we move on. I'm looking in the Q&A tab. So if you've written in the chat in the webinar room, I might not see it. Um, Pedro is asking the same as Ivor. Can I get the color table? Yes, we we'll attach it to the YouTube description of this video. Uh, can I edit in the Pro Photo color space? Uh, you can if it's uh, the ICC profile is on your system. It's not uh, installed by Capture One by default. Um, can you take a mask with the selected colors in the color editor? Yes, you can, Miguel, and we might have a look at that uh, if there's time. But yes, you can use the color editor to create that mask, which uh, can be super powerful. Um, and Zavi, that's kind of related to your question as well. Can you see what the mask is going to create? Well, you can with the view selected color range selection as well. So it is possible. Um, let's look at CZ Hill's comment on YouTube. For color correcting skin with a color cast, do you use the skin palette or the color palette? So we're, we're essentially, uh, as I said in the demo, you are picking the target that you want it to be. So let's say, look, let's zoom out. Uh, where's our mask is just on his face. So if I added a bit more mask over here, let's grab our brush and just make this bigger. So if I start masking in this area, you see how his skin tone changes color because it's now gonna match the target on his face as well, for example. So that's you know one thing to appreciate too. The second thing is, is if I expand this out, I can now make his skin any color I want to by picking this dot up. Remember, everything is being transformed to that pick point. So if we went over here, you get the idea. Not suggesting that we do that, but that's exactly what's happening. Everything in this color range is getting transformed to that point. So if we go back to something more sensible, then again, you have you know perfect control uh, over the end result of someone's skin tone. So that's kind of a bit of a hardcore introduction to layers, but as we're on the theme to uh, the color editor, then it kind of makes sense to, to tie it uh, in with uh, the skin tone tool. Now it is called uh, the skin tone tool, um, but there's no reason why you can't use it for something else. So if you have like a background paper that has some variation or dirt on it, then you can use the skin tone tool to even out your background paper or some landscape or sea or something like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so let's go back and pick up on David's example um, and look at a different tool. So once again, um, if we go back to our advanced, let's reset this and I'm gonna leave all the water in and we pick the blue sky and let's just say we had the entire saturation range. When I play with lightness, you can see it is affecting the water as well because it's got you know a little hint of that color tone in it so we can either try and cut that out which we can do so to some extent but it's also affecting the sky as well and David asked what about if I just want to do the sky so we could do a mask so we could do a quick and dirty mask like this um, so if we just masked in the sky like so and this is quick and dirty and then we can right click and say fill mask right click on the layer and say fill and that would just fill in the middle and then now essentially any color edits are only going to happen on that layer so if we click in the sky again even with the full range and then I make that darker or whatever then it's only happening on that spot so sometimes no amount of fiddling of that color range will get you to where you need to be so then adding a layer in as well for extra versatility makes sense. What I would do probably David for this shot is that I would, instead of doing a, a hand-drawn mask for speed, I would grab my gradient mask. So that's the second icon, draw at the top. I'm gonna hold my shift key down to keep it straight. And then I'm gonna hold my alt key down and make it less symmetric. So now if I press M, you can see what my fall off is like. So that's gonna give me a nice gradual fall off. It's faster than brushing by hand. And now I can do the same thing. Pick the blue sky, expand out the full range. And then now I can make that a little bit darker and a bit more saturated. Maybe not that much, but you get the idea. So that's probably how I would approach 
that photo if we just wanted to target the sky. Now, I wouldn't do it that much because that's a bit over the top, <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. So any sort of combination of any tool with a layer just makes it more versatile, more powerful, more accurate, um, and so on. Okay. Um, just thinking of Xavi's question about creating a mask from the color editor. It's kind of a bit advanced, so we're just gonna do it quick. So let's go back to berries. We had our mask here. If we turn on view selected color range, we get a fairly accurate idea of what that's gonna represent. Now, if we click on the three dots in the color editor, we can say, take that color selection and turn that into a mask. So if I say, create mask layer from selection. This is a GFX 100, so it might take uh, a few more seconds to do. And now, if I press M on my keyboard, that's where my mask is. Now, it can be a bit tricky to see the mask sometimes, which I think, Xavi, was your question. So don't forget, you can say, display the mask as a grayscale. So if I do this, then we can see exactly what the mask is. So the white areas are what we would see in red normally. So whereas before, it wasn't necessarily easy to pick up. There was a little bit on the edge of the cake here. In our grayscale mask mode, display grayscale mask, I can see there's a bit here. So now I could take my eraser, make it a little bigger, and just go on like a little cleanup mission and just take out that bit like so. And there's a little scrappy bit here. Uh, so now we've just got a mask on those red areas. And if I zoom into 100%, and this could be handy if we wanted to just sharpen these up, then we could throw a bit of extra sharpening on those guys without affecting anything else. So probably a little bit advanced for today, <laughs> So, um, uh, but just keep that thought in mind that you can use the color editor also uh, create your masks. It's uh, very handy and sometimes a time saver that the color editor can be your masking tool as well. How are we doing for time? Good, um, okay. Uh, let's have a look at continuing with the layers theme and let's edit um, our man here. So this is Tommy, Freddy, not Tommy. Is there a Tommy? No, I don't know where I got Tommy from. This is a Freddy and uh, from Russell Lord. He's uh, an ex-photographer out in Australia and kindly uh, lent me this photo. So let's look at an editing approach with, uh, with Freddy. So straight out of camera, it's pretty good. Again, it's uh, super sharp because it's uh, GFX 100, as you can see. So how would I want to edit this? Now, drawing back from what we learned in the first uh, session, so the basics, I know that if I wanted to just lift the exposure a bit, I could, and also the midtones a bit with brightness, and I wanna drop my blacks just to make it a bit more contrasty and add some clarity for some mid-tone contrast like so. Now I wanna make him stand out from the background or hide the background a little bit because it's a bit too bright for my liking. So this is a good case for another mask which is the radial mask. So the first one, the gradient mask is just like having a gradient filter in front of your lens. The radial mask allows us to create uh, complex vignette shapes. So if I go over to my shot and start drawing, then you can see the radial shape that I'm gonna make. So three lines, uh, if I press M on the keyboard, you can see the mask that's gonna be created. So if I wanna feather the mask more, I can drag the outer line. If I wanna rotate it, I can hover on the middle line and spin the radial around. So I'm gonna kick it this way, and we can change the shape of it by dragging the handles. So I don't want it too hard, so I'm gonna go something like that. Again, M, we can see the mask. So now if I wanna drop the background, I'm gonna pull the brightness down, I'm gonna pull the highlights down, and maybe the whites a little bit, and maybe a touch of exposure too. Now if I feel I haven't quite got the radio in the right place, which I don't think I have, I can go back on my shot and then just pull it around until I think it's in a good spot. And if it's too hard, then I'll just, I might pull this in a little bit too. Now that radial mask, I can do any sort of level of adjustment on that. So if I think it's making his hair a bit too dark, I might just lift up the blacks and the shadows a little bit as well. So now if we turn this on and off, then we can see the difference that makes. 
good idea to name your layers so you know on earth what's going on. So I'm just going to call this radial vignette like so. Now his eyes are a little bit on the dark side. So I could do with lifting those up a little bit. Um, like you saw with the skin tone tool, you can do the approach of you know drawing a mask and then playing with adjustments. What I sometimes like to do, or generally most of the time like to do, is to use a different technique, which is to first kind of dial in the adjustments and then paint them in where you want them. So if I click and hold on plus, I can choose to make myself a new filled adjustment layer. So this would be a layer that's created and immediately filled, so it affects the whole shot. So if I press M on my keyboard, then you can see straight away the mask is covering the whole shot. So I wanna make his eyes a little bit lighter. So I could do that in several different ways. I could try exposure, but it's not gonna lift the darkest areas so much. So I'm gonna do mid-tones with the brightness and then open up the shadows a little bit as well. Now right now it's affecting the whole shot, but I'm sort of looking at just his eyes. Now that's more than I would probably want to go, but I'm, I don't want to brighten it more than that. So if we turn this layer on and off, you can see what it's doing. So if we look at just under his eyebrows, so if I turn this layer off and on, that's probably fine. So what I'm going to do now is right click on that layer and say clear mask. And what that will do, it will get rid of the mask, but it will keep those underlying adjustments which um, I dialed in. So now if I say clear mask, it's obviously going to reset to how I want it, and now I can brush them back in. Now with my current brush settings, which is this, so size and hardness is probably about right. Let's just zoom in slightly. Size and hardness probably about right. Opacity and flow, not right. So what happens now if I start brushing? How natural does that look? Not very natural because it's the whole adjustment thrown in in one go. So if we look at the mask, there we go, oh, Zorro. Uh, so what I want to do is right click and clear the mask again. And then what I want to do is build it up slowly. So if I right click and turn the flow down, that's gonna reduce the rate at which my mask builds up as I draw over the photo. Now, depending whether you're a, a Wacom or mouse user, doesn't make much difference, but if you think, if you've got a pencil in hand, handy demo pencil, the more I draw with a pencil, the darker it's gonna get. So if I'm going back and forward on my notebook, for example, if I do lots of that, then I'm gonna get a dark line, for example. If I do a, a light stroke, then it's just gonna be a light line. Same principle with reducing flow. So now that my flow is you know, around five, now I can gradually blend and brush so that it brightens up just where I like, and then I can stop where I feel it's at the right point. The good news is, is if I take the opacity down on the layer, then we, we've got a further retrospective edit. So that looks pretty good to me. So if I turn the adjustment layers on and off, then we can see we've just lifted his eye a little bit as well. So if we zoom in, but you wouldn't really notice that I'd done anything like looking at this shot or looking at this close up, you know, there's, there's no clue that there's a mask that is sitting on his eye because it's nice and soft and blended and so on. So if we turn this adjustment layer on and off, it's just opening up his eyes a bit, but looks believable. Um, the benefit of also using that low flow method is that this mask on the right could be stronger than the one on the left just by brushing more on this side. And also if I, if I felt I'd gone too far, I can grab my eraser also with a low flow and then gradually erase over the top and then that will slowly darken down until I get to the point that I like as well. So you can always go back and forth with your brush and eraser. So if we look at our grayscale mask, uh, display grayscale, you can see how the mask varies as well. So it's quite strong here where it's, it's brighter and then it has little effect here where it's darker. Quite strong here where it's brighter, little effect here where it's darker. So it's much more uh, comprehensive uh, than just splatting a mask in all in one go. Okay, um, Tom, 
how do you make sure both eyes end up equally? I think, hopefully, that was just the answer uh, to your question. So using a low flow, of course, then you can balance, then we can think, okay, on this side, it's probably a little bit too dark, so I can give this a few more brush strokes compared to, to this one, and so on. So that's really the benefit of, of the low flow. Um, would invert mask do the same as clear mask? It would in this case, because the mask was full at 100%. But it wouldn't, if I had uh, like a 20% mask, it would end up being an 80% mask, for example. So just be careful of the, of the terminology. So clear will get rid of the mask, but it's kept those underlying adjustments. Invert will do exactly that. So if we turn on our grayscale mask and we said invert, then we get this like so. Let's invert that back and we get that. So it is two completely different operations. So in the case that we looked at, then yes, it would have done the same, but it is two different uh, options. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see, and Chiel, uh, Chili or Chiel, Chile, one of those, <laughs> pick which one was right. Sorry for, for not getting it correct. Can you paint the mask on and off? Switch with, oops, sorry, it went away. Uh, like with black conceals, white reveals. Yeah, exactly, with brush brush and eraser. So this is my mask, like so. So if I'm brushing, then with my flow nice and low, the mask is gonna get stronger and stronger. If I switch to the eraser, which you can do with E on your keyboard. So if I did E right now, I'm now on my eraser. Nice low flow. So now as I start to brush, see how it gradually fades away as well. Let's B for brush. Now it's gradually building up. So if I hide the mask um, and have B for brush, then you see as I brush, it's gonna slowly lighten, very slowly. Uh, if I hit erase and then I start to brush, it's slowly darkening like so. Now, if you want the effect to build in faster, we can just up the flow. So let's push it to 75. Now you see how much quicker it's happening. Now, if we go to eraser, up the flow, and brush back and forth, you can see how quickly it's happening. So it's very much uh, the, the same thing as the, if you like, the Photoshop principle of black and white. So we're just brushing and, uh, and erasing. Now, again, we can also just darken that down a bit. Now I've really made a mess of the job I did earlier. So let's bring the flow down. I'm gonna cut the highlight out on his cheek down a bit, and that's pretty good. Okay, so, checking time because uh, we've just got to throw in a little bit about um, tethering. Um, we've been looking at the color editor and layers, but what about uh, the color balance tool, which is a different beast entirely, um, but very easy to use. And we just continue with the same photo and using layers um, as well. Uh, so with the color balance tool, different to the color editor in that the color editor tool is designed to uh, pick a color and change the appearance of it. Whereas the color balance tool is really designed to uh, grade or color tint the whole image. So um, I'm gonna start by making a new field adjustment layer. So we're gonna keep our color grading on its own separate layer. Let's make this tool a bit bigger so we can see what's going on. Uh, maybe not that big. Um, let's name this one, which was eyeballs. And then this one is a current filled layer, which isn't doing anything. But we're gonna use our color balance tool with it. Now this is a really simple tool to learn. 60 seconds and you'll be a master at it. So essentially it's split up into a master wheel and a shadow, midtone, and highlight wheels. And three-way simply shows shadow, midtone, and highlights all together. So going back to the master one, this just puts a color tint over the entire image. So if you wanted to warm this up a bit, we would grab the middle point and drag this to the warmer tones. The further out I get, the greater the saturation. So if I went in this direction, we'd have teal. If I went in this direction, we'd be warmer, going to orange, red, purple, and so on. So that's the first part. Now that's a great tool for fixing a color cast, adding a color tint, and so on. Now, three-way allows you to split out shadows, midtones, and highlights and apply differing color tints to those. Now, the fact that we have this on a layer also means that um, 
I can add other adjustments into the mix and I can also change the opacity. So let's say we wanted to have a more muted color palette for this shot. We could go to the uh, saturation and we could take saturation down and then we could throw in in our color palette wise whatever we wanted. So his skin is probably going to be in the mid-tone so I'm going to warm that up a touch and then uh, the highlights we could do something different but I think I'd leave it alone and then the shadows we could go to more teal something like that. Now next to each color wheel is also another slider which changes the density of each of those. So if I was to bring those down that would darken the shadows or lift the shadows. Now it's not the same as shadow recovery getting more detail into it it's basically including the luminance of uh, those individual areas. So if we wanted to flatten this off a bit, we could lift those up and then pull the highlights down and get like a lower contrast effect. Now the cool thing is that's on a, a layer. So let's just call this color grading because we can turn this on and off to see before and after. If I felt that was too much, we could bring opacity down and get our kind of balance to where we feel it suits. Or of course, if we don't like that, we could turn this layer off. We could build another layer and try a different color grading and experiment and so on. But it's really nice to be able to split that up. But this is a really simple tool to use. There's also some presets that you can play around with as well, just to get some inspiration as well. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Um, Simon was saying uh, he was struggling with his shortcuts. So, uh, you weren't specific Simon, but hopefully you're trying edit, edit keyboard shortcuts. Um, I would make yourself your own set. So if you go to the default, just click plus and then it will duplicate it. And then search for whatever you want. So you were mentioning um, Q for focus here as well. Q for uh, by default takes you to uh, the healing brush, I think. So if we type heal. Then we've got draw healing mask. So then if I want that as Q, I could put that in there. That's currently used by focus mask and will be reassigned like so. So that way we can set up the shortcuts to whatever you want. So try that again, Simon, and try duplicating uh, your default set. Uh, can we use LUTs in this process? No, you, no, you can't. So Capture One works uh, around ICC profiles. So you can change and muck around the ICC profiles, but um, uh, you can't use LUTs. But on that question, one thing I should have mentioned actually, if we go to the base characteristics tool, you'll see the color profile that we're using, which we create in-house. And under curve, you'll also have access to Fuji film simulations as well. So auto means use the film simulation that was used in camera at the time, or you can go through and you can pick any of the other film sims as well. So just be aware that you have that option to switch out to different film simulations too. I meant to mention that earlier on, but there it is under base characteristics. Okay, a couple of questions from um, YouTube. With the radial mask, can you use it to adjust inside and outside? Yes, you can. So if we go to the back to the radial and choose my radial uh, cursor tool, this one here. Um, Right now, if I press M on the keyboard, you can see where the mask is. Now, if you right click, you can say, draw mask inside, and that will change the default behavior. So that means it will always be drawing in on the inside. Let's make a new layer. Uh, so if I say, keep it as it was before, or you can grab the outer circle and snap it over the inner circle, like so. So as soon as you snap outer over to inner, you can do so. Or you can right click and you can say invert as well. Does does the same thing. But uh, yes, you can change the default behavior with a right click or snap outer over inner. Um, mm, mm, mm. Could you do a color pop, all black and white except for one color? Yeah, you could Clive really, just with the example here on this layer, you can't use the black and white tool on a layer. That's an incompatible tool. But to be honest, if you then punched a hole in this layer, for example, so then my color grading would only be on that particular area, for example. 
So you can either do it that way, let's just fill that mask so his eye doesn't look weird, um, and then just desaturate. So yes, you could do it that way. Um, let's see. Um, just looking at um, a few questions. <laughs> um, yeah, that's. I just saw someone comment that. And again, if we don't answer your specific question, I am sorry, we sort of do our best to try and uh, cater to everyone. But um, we're kind of touching on a few different subjects here. So if layers in, is interesting to you, go back in the Learning Hub and you'll find lots of content just on layers. If color editing is interesting to you, uh, go back to the Learning Hub and then you'll be able to filter by color editing as well. So it's very possible to you know, find inspiration on all these various different things as well. Oh, that's a good question from Glenn actually. Can you paint out part of the radial vignette like over Freddie's shoulder? Yes, you can. So two great advantages. So if I select my radial cursor tool again, it's always dynamic. So I can always go back in and then tweak the radial as I wish, like so. Um, now, if I think I'd actually just like to erase a little bit of the radial mask. Naturally, you would think, well, let's grab the eraser tool and then I'm going to go over here. Let's just make my eraser brush not quite so hard. And I want to erase, let's say, just a little bit here. So as soon as I start to try and do that, it says the mask must be rasterized, which essentially means lock the radial mask as it is. So it will no longer be dynamic and we can edit it. So you can either click rasterize or if you know that you're, you want to erase something, you can right click on the mask and say rasterize like so. So now if I say rasterize, the mask is as it was, but if I was to choose the radial tool, you see I can't then retrospectively change it, but what it does mean I could then go in and erase and it's kind of if I like I'd drawn the mask myself, to be honest. So it is, it is possible to, to do that, but good relevant question, Glenn, thank you. Um, let's have a look. Um, now there's plenty of other things that you can also do with masks that uh, we haven't discussed today and I'm just mindful of the time because we're going to do our 60 second tethering bit. So again, um, if there's inspiration from any of those subjects, just go back in the learning hub and pick them up. Uh, so the question is, does Capture One do as good a job as the native camera software? I would say easily uh, and markedly better. So, but don't take my word for it, Daniel. Just give it a try and see what you think. Okay, so when it comes to tethering, now this might be a failed demo because the software that we use for live broadcasting can also connect uh, to the X-T2 that I have just sitting behind me. Um, so whether it will connect to Capture One or not will be interesting. I had a quick test before we went live um, and then they were kind of fighting over the connection. So let's see. Now, first of all, for the GFX 100 users out there, two things to note on the GFX um, and one thing to note uh, in general. So first of all, on the GFX 100, uh, boost mode should be turned on. So that's under power management, I believe, in the menu system. If boost mode is off, I've had issues tethering to my MacBook Pro. If you happen to have a uh, MacBook Pro 16 inch, um, then you will find that, and I can't remember which side it is, but I had a GFX 100 in front of me. It would connect perfectly happily to a 2018 or a 2016 MacBook Pro on either port, didn't matter. On this MacBook Pro, which is a, uh, the 16 inch, it only connects to one side. So you've got two USB-C ports on either side of the MacBook Pro. I thought they were all created equal, but apparently they are not. So if you hook up your GFX to the left-hand side and nothing happens, stick it in the right-hand side and then you might find it will magically connect. So boost mode on. Uh, if you're on a MacBook Pro 16, connect to, I think it was the right-hand side, but just process of elimination 50-50. Try one side or uh, try the other. The third thing is when it comes to uh, tethering is being mindful of uh, USB, USB requirements. Uh, so USB-C, which is on the GFX 100, 
uh, the maximum suggested length is three meters standard. Now you might get away with a longer one at four meters, um, but the chances are then the connection is not gonna be quite as stable. So if you do want to go longer than the USB-C standard, then you need to look at uh, boosters and so on. Uh, the other thing that you can also consider um, is that like the GFX MacBook Pro 16 issue is that the power on your USB port is not strong enough to maintain a stable uh, connection. So that's also something to consider as well. Um, so let's just kill this catalog for a minute. When we shoot tethered, it's best to shoot into a session, which is an alternative method of file management for Capture One. And as I said, we're gonna get into this in much more detail when we do a tethered shoot webinar, which will be coming up in July, probably towards the end of July. It will go up on the Learning Hub um, over some time next week, and then that will give us an opportunity to get much more into tethered shooting. But for now, we say file, new session, and we're just gonna call this Fuji Film XT2. And we're gonna cross our fingers and hope it connects to Capture One and not the live broadcast software. So I'm gonna turn her on, plug in the USB. Um, helps if you have the USB cable the right way up. There we go, and lo and behold, oh, it connected briefly and <laughs> and I think the live broadcast software took it over. Oh, there we go, we're back. Fingers crossed it stays that way. Either way, as I said, it might be a very uh, brief demonstration. Um, now with a session, I'm gonna describe the 30 second. This is uh, what we made, our XT2 session. The general workflow is that you shoot into the capture folder, your final exports go to the output folder, uh, you can move the best shots to the selects folder and all the crappy stuff goes in the trash. That's a very simple session workflow. So what I recommend for, for you guys and girls out there watching is to do file, new session, plug in your camera, and just shoot and have a play around. You'll see in the first tool tab, this is where we have all the various different settings related to uh, tethered capture. So we can see here that we've got our uh, X-T2 lit up uh, with some adjustments available a tool for setting up how the shots get named as they come in. So by default, it uses uh, uh, the name that's shown here and a camera counter. Um, the next capture location by default will always go to the capture folder. And then we've got a little bit about handling adjustments. And really, uh, that's all there is to it. Now, if we shoot, again, fingers crossed, if, uh, if it's gonna behave itself, uh, no idea if the exposure correct. That's just that little Polaroid camera sitting behind me. I seem to have exposure compensation on. So let's just put that in the other direction and shoot again. So you can shoot from camera or you can shoot direct uh, from Capture One. And then in they pop. And then you can see in the Capture folder, the sh shots just coming in like so. It's really as simple and as quick uh, as that. Now this is an old-ish X-T2 but time from capture to um, uh, shoot is pretty good. Um, I just turned it off and on again because this X-T2 I think is on its way out. So let's just do another quick shot. So time to shoot to it appearing in capture one uh, is pretty quick as well. Um, so as I said, my advice to you, hook up your camera and just give it a try. It's very simple. You don't really need to set up anything specific. If you have any uh, issues in capture one, go to the preferences and then just make sure under the capture tab you've got all uh, you've got Fujifilm manufacturer ticked if you're using capture one just for Fujifilm then you don't have those options then it only works uh, for Fujifilm but it's a really simple super easy setup and um, as I said just give it a try for yourselves just be mindful of those USB restrictions on length power out your USB port. If it's too weedy, use a uh, powered USB hub. That's a good way around it. And then try different cables and all those various other things as well. Um, Gary was saying, is that just the GFX 100, not the 50? Um, I haven't had the issue myself um, on the GFX 50. As I say, it was a curious thing um, that I saw only uh, on the GFX 100. So that's really my explanation uh, for that. 
So you see if I hit this button here, then we also get the shot. And the way it works in Capture One, if I was to make an adjustment, like if we tweak that, sorry for this poor photography, and we take um, another shot, then that adjustment is carried over to the next one. So that's really how the default works as well. So everything kind of behaves as expected. Super simple, super easy. Give it a try yourself. Um, good question from Tom. On the free version for Capture One, there is a free version Capture One Fuji Express. Are any of these features available? So what you've seen today, Tom, the basic color editor you can use. There's no layers workflow, that's pro only. Uh, the basic tools we used last week in the exposure tab and so on are all available but the advanced tools like the advanced color editor, the skin tone editor, layers, shooting tethered, are not available uh, in the free version. Okay, last few questions, and then I promised I wouldn't overrun, and I lied to everyone again, um, but there we go. Is it possible to use live view? Depending on the camera, it you can get compatible live view. Again, on our website, there's a matrix which will show you, yes, this camera is supported for tethered. Can it do live view? Yes or no. Now with the mechanical Fujis like the X that we have uh, hooked up in the background, some of the adjustments I can't change in Capture One. So you see uh, aperture is grayed out because of uh, the mechanical dials and some limitations in firmware. The GFX 100, you kind of have a fluid interchange between Capture One and the camera because of the virtual dials. But the GFX 50, then I can't change all the parameters in Capture One. I can only change them on the camera. And that's just a limitation of the mechanical dials and how the GFX um, is set up. Good question for um, from Chile. Uh, does the Fuji only version have everything the Pro version does, but it only works with Fuji cameras? Perfect description. So Capture One Pro works with all camera models manufacturers. Uh, Capture One Pro Fujifilm only works with Fujifilm cameras, but it has all the pro goodies. So basically, if you only shoot Fujifilm cameras, save yourself some money and buy pro Fujifilm. If you shoot a variety of different camera brands, then your best bet is to buy uh, Capture One Pro. Uh, let's see, last, let's pick two more questions and then we shall finish. Uh, just looking in the webinar itself. Um, and again, Diana was asking, when shooting tethered with the X-T2, I cannot change the camera settings from Capture One. They switch back to whatever is set on the camera. Unfortunately, that is a limitation of the firmware in the X-T2. There's no way we can tell it to override the mechanical dials, if you like. Um, so that is simply how the X-T2 functions. If you want that fluid interchange, then you have to buy GFX 100. Um, or ask Fujifilm if they can do something uh, with the firmware. Um, Holger was asking, I just started to use Capture One from Lightroom, thank you. Can I save the characteristics as settings and go from there if needed? Yeah, so the, the way it works, let's just go back to our um, other catalog, rather than looking at my bad desktop shot. Um, so the base characteristics, as I said, it set on auto, it will just pick up the film sim you used in the camera. Now, if you wanted to retrospectively change that, you can just pick it up here. Let's say I wanted pro neg high. And then if I wanted to change that to a, you know another shot, if I shift select these three shots and hit copy apply, this little button here, then I can just say copy the film curve, which is this over to those other shots and then now these will also be using pro neg high as you can see so yes okay last question um, is there an upgrade path from the Fuji only version to the full pro yes so at any point you can log into captureone.com into your profile and you'll see a list of your current licenses and how they can be upgraded so if you bought into capture one Fujifilm but then went and bought another camera product that wasn't Fuji, close your ears, Fuji employees, um, then yes, you could upgrade. There is generally always an upgrade path as well. And can you share, save your shooting in two different places? Uh, no, you can't. It will only go to one default place, but what I suggest to people is because the session concept 
is so simple. Let's say you were shooting to this session as we were doing. Um, on the Mac, I recommend a piece of software called Chronosync, and then you just ask Chronosync to duplicate this session hierarchy. So all the time you're shooting, Chronosync will just mirror this. So if you have any issues, for example, uh, then you can just restore immediately. And that's really simple to do with the session structure because you just point to this folder and say mirror that and then you always have a constant backup. Okay, thanks for joining today everybody. Uh, sorry for overrunning uh, as I tend to do. Um, I hope you found it uh, useful as well. If you're not on Capture One, don't forget you can download and take a trial and uh, this was recorded too. So the fact that we stream this on YouTube, if you missed any of it, you can just rewind it in a couple of minutes and go straight back to the start if you wish. It will be there uh, immediately as well. Great. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and see you all again soon. Bye now.